Hello, ground level. Well, here we are again in lockdown, and I was thinking, what could I share with you as leaders and friends that will be helpful? And I really think that I've got a word that uh, will be uh, helpful to all of us as we try to make sure that our relationships, both with God and with one another, are doing well. So I want to share today on the subject, connected to thrive. Connected to thrive. And you know, the word thrive means to grow with vigor. I don't believe at any period of time we're meant just to maintain. There's always that sense of pushing on and moving forward. And very, it's very difficult, isn't it, in times of stress and difficulty to just keep our uh, pushing forward mentality. And so I want to talk about how important it is at this season that we're in to remain strongly connected to God through Jesus and, of course, being connected to one another. It's one of our values uh, at ground level. So, connected to thrive. And I want to take us to what I would call an allegory of discipleship. We're going to go to John chapter 15. And in symbolic form, Jesus outlines uh, what it means to be his disciples. He talks about being the vine and we are the branches. And of course, the central thought that many of us will have been brought up on is the abiding in the vine. Uh, but it's really about our strength of relationship as disciples of Jesus being strongly at home with Jesus in what I would call an enduring, strong relationship. And so I want to read John 15 and I'm going to take us to the message uh, paraphrase because I think there are some helpful thoughts here. I was brought up on the, the word abide or abiding, kind of constantly abiding. But actually the phrase that uh, is used in this paraphrase is this little phrase being at home. And I love the thought that actually in our relationship with Jesus, as we are disciples of Jesus, we're kind of at home in that relationship. We feel welcomed, but there's also this idea of an enduring, strong relationship. And so in this allegory, Jesus says, I'm the vine, you are the branches. Let me read from John 15. It's quite a long passage, uh, so stick with it. And uh, I'm using this because many of us will read regularly other translations. I found that this opened uh, some thoughts for me. So... Uh, chapter 15, verse 1, I am the real vine, and my father is the farmer. He cuts off every branch of me that doesn't bear grapes. And every branch that is grape-bearing, he prunes back, so it will bear even more. You are already pruned back by the message I have spoken. Live in me. Make your home in me. There's that phrase, it, it comes a number of times. Make your home in me just as I do in you. In the same way that a branch can't bear grapes by itself, but only by being joined to the vine, you can't bear fruit unless you are joined with me. I am the vine, you are the branches. When you're joined with me and I with you, the relation intimate and organic, the harvest is sure to be abundant. Separated, you can't produce a thing. Anyone who separates from me is dead wood gathered up and thrown on the bonfire. But if you make yourselves at home with me and my words are at home in you, you can be sure that whatever you ask will be listened to and acted upon. This is how my father shows who he is. When you produce grapes, when you mature as my disciples. I've loved you the way my father has loved me. Make yourselves at home in my love. If you keep my commands, you'll remain intimately at home in my love. That's what I've done, kept my father's commands and made myself at home in his love. I've told you these things for a purpose, that my joy might be your joy and your joy wholly mature. This is my command, love one another the way I loved you. This is the very best way to love. Put your life on the line for your friends. You are my friends when you do the things I command you. I'm no longer calling you servants because servants don't understand what their master is thinking and planning. No, I've named you friends 
because I've let you in on everything I've heard from the Father. You didn't choose me. Remember, I chose you and put you in the world to bear fruit, fruit that won't spoil. As fruit bearers, whatever you ask the Father in relation to me, he gives you. But remember the root command, love one another. Familiar story, Jesus, this kind of allegory, Jesus is the vine, we are the branches. But I put it to you that the best way to understand Jesus' teaching, we have to think about two things. The first is the symbolism that's used, and the second is the context of the story. In order to understand fully what Jesus is really saying, I think these two things are important. And so we'll firstly think a little bit about the symbolism. Jesus says, I'm the vine, you are the branches. And I believe that the people of the day would straight away have thought of one thing. As soon as Jesus said, I'm the vine, you are the branches, they would have thought instantly of the nation of Israel. You see, right through the Bible, Israel is seen as the vine. Jeremiah 2 verse 21 says, I had planted you like a choice vine of sound and reliable stock. And then it goes on to say, how then did you turn against me into a corrupt wild vine? You will find that actually God's intention was that Israel was this vine that produced fruit. But in many of the verses that talk about Israel, it also talks about Israel not being connected in strongly enough. Psalm 80 verses 8 and 9 says these words, You brought a vine out of Egypt. You drove out the nations and planted it. You cleared the ground for it and it took root and filled the land. So Israel was the vine. This is the symbolism that uh, the people would have understood. Hosea 10 and verse 1 says, Israel was a spreading vine. He brought forth fruit for himself. And then there's an interesting couple of verses in Isaiah and chapter 5. In my Bible, it's called the Song of the Vineyard. And as we bring these thoughts, connect them with what Jesus says in uh, John 15. Uh, in Isaiah 5 verse 1, it says this, I will sing for the one I love, a song about his vineyard. My loved one had a vineyard on a fertile hillside. He dug it and cleared it of stones and planted it with choicest vines. He built a watchtower in it and cut out a wine press as well. Then he looked for a crop of good grapes, but it yielded only bad fruit. So there you see that uh, the imagery that's being used is Israel is the vine, but Israel has not remained connected to their God. And so often there's been a disconnect between the nation of Israel and the God who uh, was wanting to liberate them and set them free. And if you follow the thoughts into the New Testament, one of the parables that Jesus shared in Mark chapter 12, uh, starts with the words, a man planted a vineyard. And again, you'll know something of this story. The tenants that looked after the vineyard killed off the servants and eventually uh, the son of the owner gets killed. And of course, we later find that Jesus is pointing to the fact that Israel has gone against the prophets, has spoken against even uh, Jesus the Son. So Israel failed to be the fruitful vine. So the symbolism is very clear. The people would understand that this was talking about Israel. But also, as well as the symbolism, we need to look a little at the context of the passage. You see, when Jesus spoke those words, I'm the vine, you're the branches, it was spoken on Passover night, around the time of the Lord's Supper. And on the Passover table, there would be three things. There would be the lamb, the bread, and the fruit of the vine, or wine. And of course, we now know that as John the Baptist said, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, we would understand the symbolism points to Jesus who's going to sacrifice his life and, of course, on the table, the bread and the wine 
uh, they take on new significance, don't they? As Jesus is the bread of life and, and the wine is his blood. And so we begin to understand in the context of the words that are being shared, uh, the people are going to understand a little more of what Jesus is talking about in terms of him being the vine. Also, there are two stories that come before uh, chapter 15, and in fact, both are found in chapter 13, two chapters earlier. And these two stories, again, uh, give us illumination into the, into the thoughts that Jesus is sharing in John 15. The first of these stories is the washing of the disciples' feet. And you'll find that in John 13, very familiar words where Jesus with his disciples, he uh, takes a towel and he washes the feet of the disciples. And you remember that some people struggled with that because he was a model of servanthood they were not used to. And I think a key verse from that passage is this. Jesus said these words, a person who has had a bath needs only to wash his feet. His whole body is clean, and you are clean, though not every one of you. So hold that thought in your mind, the washing of the disciples' feet. And also, in the same chapter, you'll find Judas betrays Jesus. And in that story, Jesus takes hold of bread and he passes it to Judas. And it says that Judas takes the bread and Satan enters into him. In verse 27 of that chapter, Jesus says, what you are about to do, do quickly. So hold those thoughts in your mind. And it's important that we understand that when Jesus uses the word prune in the uh, John 15 chapter, that word prune, as you'll see in the index, can mean cleanse. It's the same word, pruning and cleansing. And in those days, people spoke of cleansing the branches. We might use that in terms of cleansing the land. So we would say pruning, but the thought here is of cleansing. And so with that as a backdrop, I want to take us to John 15 and look at it together. And I hope that uh, what I come up with will be helpful to us all and remember, we're looking at an allegory of what it means to be a disciple of Jesus. So right at the beginning here in verse 1, Jesus says, I am the true vine and my father is the gardener or my father is the farmer. So Jesus is the true or genuine vine. Well, linking with what I've said, the people would have thought of Israel. And so Israel, in a sense, was foreshadowing Jesus coming. And Jesus says, I'm the true vine. My father is the gardener. That unique relationship between Jesus and his father. And we together now can pray, as Jesus taught us, our father. And so this passage about, I'm the vine, you are the branches, uh, this is not for a collection of individuals. It is actually addressed to the new society. We could call it the Israel of God. And I know we know this at the ground level, but we were never intended just to be on our own, isolated branches. We are connected in with Jesus. We are called to be a new society. The book of Ephesians is packed with what it really means to be part of the church. So verse 1, Jesus is the true, the genuine uh, vine. And then in verse 2 it says, He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. So you can imagine here, Jesus warns that disciples must not act as Judas acted. That moment of betrayal, the cutting off from the presence of Jesus. And so as we look at this chapter, there are perhaps two really main emphasis that come through. The first is this word we've looked at, abiding, remaining, being connected, and intimately being at home in this enduring strong relationship. The heart of this is our relationship as disciples with Jesus Christ. 
abiding in him, remaining in him, being so solidly connected. But also, I love this point, being at home in his presence. So the first emphasis is abiding. And the second is this picture of pruning. I remember as a boy, I didn't like the thought of the concept of pruning because pruning means cutting, but it also means cleansing. And of course, thankfully, it's God who's our good father who does the pruning and uh, this is good for us. So pruning is a good thing. Now, I can't speak with authority on lots of things, but I do know a little bit about pruning. Uh, I was taught by uh, a gardener the art of pruning, and he laboriously took me through how you prune roses. And he would show me uh, the angle of the cut. He would show me where the cut uh, was to take place. And it was in order that you got better and larger roses. And so the picture of pruning is a great one because if you prune things well, you get greater productivity. The vine begins to thrive. If you do the cutting part well, you get more and more grapes and good grapes. And sometimes when, when a gardener prunes, it almost looks as though they've killed the plant. You know, when I first started pruning roses, I would just take a little off the ends of the branches. But I learned through the years that actually if you go deeper and further down the plant, and sometimes it looks through the winter period as though the plant has been killed, actually what happens, you get better flowers and bigger flowers. And that's the kind of picture here that uh, our father is the gardener and he makes sure that the cleansing process in terms of our discipleship that he works in this process. So pruning is good for us. It produces fruitfulness. So verse 2 says, so that it will be even more fruitful. You see, you can leave uh, a rose bush and it will still have some roses. But it's actually a really great thing when you cut back and you begin to see actually a greater spread of flowers. And I'm pretty sure it's the same for the vine. The pruning process creates greater productivity. And verse 3 says, you are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Link that with what we said about the washing of the disciples' feet. Jesus says, you, you only need your feet washing. The word of God cleanses. And here's this picture. Jesus says, I am the vine, you are the branches. It's about remaining in Jesus, about being solidly remaining in Christ. And so through John 15, you get uh, over and over again, uh, verse 5, much fruit. Uh, verse 8, much fruit. Uh, verse 16, fruit that will last and that, I think, is what we're talking about, thriving. God wants us in our local churches to thrive. He wants us to do well. He wants us to be successful. And of course, Jesus says, without that connection, you can do nothing. All of us now, even the most gifted leaders, in terms of church life, can achieve very little on their own. It's this divine connection. It's being with Jesus. You see, discipleship and apprenticeship is a lifelong process of growing and developing. And how many of us know that the, the cutting back of things can create greater productivity? It may just be at this season that God is able to use what is a pretty dark period to help us to understand that if we cut back in this period of time, we may achieve more. And I've been cut back. I guess you've been cut back. You can't have the same face-to-face -face meetings with people. We can't meet in uh, buildings like we could. We've not got as many meetings. And I'm saying to our staff over and over again, now it's got simple. Let's not rush back into more activity and more meetings. Let's cut back. That's that phrase, cut back. 
And so if it works in terms of our workload and our uh, church life, then surely in terms of our character development and in terms of our discipleship, cutbacks are going to be more productive. And my prayer is that God will work in our characters in order that his pruning work is not seen as something to be avoided, but it's something to be welcomed. And I believe as you read this chapter, that will lead on to three very specific things. The first thing is this, our prayers, our prayer life uh, will increase. Our prayer life increasing. In verse 7, it says this, If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be given you. Sometimes we take that verse and we just quote it, but it's so much in the context of being united with Christ. And the more we know Christ, the more we'll be praying in line with his will. And so as we allow the cleansing process in our lives, our prayer life will increase. Secondly, our love for God and others is increasing. In verse 12, it says here, uh, my command is this, love each other as I have loved you, greater love has no one than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. And then the third thing that I think is important, the first is to do with our prayer life, it increases. The second is to do with our love for God and our love for other people, it increases. And then thirdly, our intimacy with God increases. And verse 15 says... I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends. And so we move, don't we, from just being servants. There's this movement towards friendship, you know, where we become friends of God. And so today, across ground level, can I encourage us to recognize that everything that we do in terms of ministry is directly related to how strongly we are connected in, connected to the vine. And also, it has to do with the pruning processes and the cleansing. Uh, as we are being discipled, as we are being changed, the Bible says, from one degree of glory to another. The cutting back and the cutting away process is very, very important. And perhaps we're loath to allow the cutting process. Perhaps we feel vulnerable uh, when we have less on our program. But I think we will get more achieved in terms of our workload if we cut, cut back and prioritize the things that we're doing. Now, I think we kind of as leaders get these principles, but I want to go a little bit deeper into this issue of intimacy. You see, there's something in this passage that talks about a strong, enduring relationship with Jesus that causes us to thrive. And there's also the picture of Jesus and his Father, that love relationship. And Jesus says, I want to move you from just being servants and workers. I want to move you into this friendship, this devotion, this commitment and I believe, actually, the Bible points to a great depth of intimacy. And so I'd like to take you from one allegory story, the vine and the branches, to a second allegory that you'll find in the Old Testament that we call the Song of Songs, or the Song of Solomon. This is the greatest of songs, the Song of Songs. And I don't think that many people... Uh, read this thoughtfully, and of course there are many different opinions as to the meaning of the Song of Songs. I personally believe it has uh, different meanings and lots of meanings, and I'm not sure that you can say this interpretation's right and that one is wrong. Uh, there are great Bible teachers that have said, don't look into it too much as an allegory. It's just a love relationship between a man and his wife, and it shows deep intimacy uh, between just ordinary people. And of course, it's great, you know, if you're, uh, you're married, read through Song of Songs. It's pretty impressive stuff in terms of just the physical relationship that a man and woman can have. 
But many through church history have interpreted uh, Song of Songs as an allegory of the love of the church for the Son of God. In the Western world, and particularly males, find it quite difficult to go into the imagery of Jesus uh, in terms of intimacy with Jesus in that kind of way. It's hard to think through that imagery. And whether you accept that Song of Songs is an allegory or not, uh, I think we'd all agree that in the book of Ephesians, one of the pictures with regard to the church is the Bride of Christ. And there you can't get away from the imagery of an intimate relationship between Jesus, the bridegroom, and Jesus, his church. There's something special about that. Hudson Taylor, in his commentary on Song of Songs, describes the journey of the Christian from fear and failure to discovering how to abide forever in Christ. He saw the link between Song of Songs and this intimacy we're talking about with Jesus. And in fact, he called his commentary union and communion. And I believe that it might be important for us to think a little bit more again about our love for God and how intimate that is. I remember in the early days of the charismatic movement, there were lots of songs about intimate love with Jesus. And we sang things, and sometimes men were uncomfortable with it. Jesus, how lovely you are. Uh, we're told in the New Testament, go back to your first love. Here's a challenge today. Do you feel that kind of love for Jesus today? Has it got a little professional? Or, you know, are there times when there's a sense of a deep, deep love that we have for God? And so... Hudson Taylor certainly saw union and communion in this picture. I'm the vine, you're the branches. Communion, the picture of the wine, the bread and the wine. And can I su suggest that in your devotions, you might want to look at two particular passages. And I'm not asking you to agree with me in the first instance. So, of course, when revelation comes... I think you'll perhaps find there's some validity in what I'm going to say. But I want to take us to Revelation chapter 1, and they're the words that John on Patmos, he has a vision of Jesus, and, and there's this amazing picture of the glory of Jesus. Uh, and if you read Revelation chapter 1, you'll find imagery to do with majesty, royalty. He has a uh, a golden band around his chest, eternity and the white dazzling hair of Jesus, the bright eyes, all-seeing, cosmic almost picture of the ascended Christ. And it's worth taking some time to go to Revelation chapter 1 and, and read through all the imagery to do with the ascended Jesus and you'll have no doubt of his sovereignty, his power, his royalty, his splendor. And if you read it, you'll think, how can I have a, a relationship with Jesus? His, you know, his eyes are blazing, his feet are like brown, bronze, and he's glowing with power. And then you think about your own life, and you think, well... You know, how can I, as a human being, ever have an intimate relationship with Jesus? And thank God we are being changed from one degree of glory, and we know there'll be an eternal day when there are new heavens and new earth, and we'll have new bodies and all of that. But Revelation chapter 1 gives us this picture of the majesty of Jesus. But I challenge you to go to Song of Songs and find chapter 5, and there there is a detailed picture of a man. Now, some would say, well, it's Solomon. Some would say it's just a picture of a good-looking man. But if you go through the imagery, you'll find that this man uh, doesn't have white hair. He has black, wavy hair. This man doesn't have eyes that are blazing with fire. This man has, it says, eyes like doves. In other words, there's peace, there's tranquility. And as you look at that image, 
of uh, the man, and I'm suggesting that we could use that today and think about Jesus in this kind of way. The picture then is not one of majesty, greatness, royalty, all-seeing, omnipresent, all-powerful, uh, cosmic. No, the picture we see in Song of Songs in chapter 5 is an intimate picture of his purity, of his beauty. It's a personal picture. Uh, Mike Bickle, some of you may remember that name, Mike Bickle talks of many different types of emotions that are fragrant. He talks about Jesus' emotional makeup is filled with passion and delight. He is the lover of our souls. Again, I used to hear that language, he's the lover of our souls. He's the fairest of 10,000. And sometimes we've drifted perhaps from that deep love uh, that perhaps we first had for Christ and maybe we need to return, as the scriptures say, to our first love. Our relationship with Jesus through cleansing and through pruning actually finds expression in our worship. I was interested to find that the prayer of humble access in the communion service, in the uh, Book of Common Prayer, um, many Anglicans will know this, I've, I've read it from time to time, but I want to read this prayer which speaks of unity and communion, but you'll notice the imagery is quite deep and it is uh, of an intimacy uh, that I think is important. Here's the prayer, and maybe we should pray this prayer. It's very deep in its understanding. It says this, Grant us therefore, gracious Lord, so to eat the flesh of thy dear Son, Jesus Christ, and to drink his blood, that our sinful bodies may be made clean by his body, and our souls washed through his most precious blood, and that we may evermore dwell or abide or be at home in him and he in us. Well, I hope some of these thoughts are, are helpful to you. It's certainly in my quest to know Jesus more. Jesus says, I'm the true, the genuine vine. Everything that was being expressed in the nation of Israel, all the hopes and aspirations, uh, uh, are found in Jesus and his church. And the beauty is, of course, that before the foundation of the world, God didn't just have Israel in his mind. But through Israel, all the ends of the earth would be blessed. And so Jesus is the true Israel. Jesus is the true vine, the genuine vine. And we as members of the body of Christ, are the branches. And this intimate, isn't this a great thought today that everything we are and everything we have flows from him. All the images in the New Testament tell us the same. You know, we're part of the body of Christ and everything flows from the head, which is Christ. This picture of the bride and the groom, everything that we need comes from an intimate, working, loving relationship with Jesus Christ. He's the head of the body. He's the groom in the wedding. He's the captain in the army. Everything we need. He's the cornerstone in the temple. And a relationship with him is vitally important. I hope I've stirred you a little to begin to think that cutbacks are not always bad. And to trust that in the cleansing process that sometimes we resist, if we'll let him cut us back a little further, if we'll trust him, if we'll recognize that we're being pruned by our Father who art in heaven, then maybe as we submit to him, which is what discipline and discipleship is about, I want to be a genuine disciple of Jesus. I don't want to be a Judas who makes the commitment and then turns and betrays and as a result is dead wood, as the message puts it. I want to be someone who thrives through connections, and I know that's your heart as well. So as I bring this to a conclusion, 
I think there are many things today that can flow to us in fresh ways. Maybe you have a little bit more time today for some devotional thinking. Why not go to those two passages and look at them side by side? Get a picture of the majesty of the ascended Christ, but also look at the beauty uh, of Jesus and the intimate relationship you can share with him. So as we remain in him, as we are at home in him, allow him to prune and to cleanse us. And so there are a few things that we can expect. This is what I'm expecting. The strength of God flows into our weakness. Are you feeling as though you've not got it for the next stage of the journey? Well, you're connected to strength. The strength of God flows into our weakness. The peace of God flows into our restlessness. Maybe there are people that are really struggling with, uh, you know, restlessness, confusion even. There's sometimes issues of anger. Perhaps you've been wounded and hurt. But the peace of God flows into that restlessness. Jesus actually is the Prince of Peace, isn't he? The joy of God flows into our sadness. Some of you may have faced issues in your church life or in your family life, areas of bereavement. I was talking to someone recently who'd had five members of their family that had died, not, not through the COVID situation, but when you, when you face issues of bereavement, you need to know you're connected to the right place. You and I know that we're surrounded by media that is all the time bringing us potentially into darkness and despair, but we're joined. We're not joined to just natural things. We're joined to the vine, and it's the genuine vine. The joy of God flows into our sadness. If there are areas of sadness and even bereavement, let the joy flow. Let the presence of Jesus flow through the branches. And I love this, that we're in this together. And then, of course, the love of God flows into our hardness. There are times, aren't there, when we get a bit hard-hearted. The, the prophet saw, you know, that God wanted to turn hard hearts into hard, you know, hard hearts, hearts of stone. He wants to turn into flesh. And the love of God always does that. The love of God flows into the hard areas of our life. Have you got a little hardened through the years? Perhaps I'm speaking to some leaders that have been doing this for a long, long time and you thought you had it worked out and then this new season arrived and you feel as though you're struggling to keep your head above water. Well, the love of God flows into our hardness today. And then finally, the shalom or the wholeness of God flows into our brokenness. Anything that's disjointed, any broken relationships, any fallouts, whether in family, with friends, or in the church, if we're connected, shalom flows. The Prince of Peace flows. God wants us to thrive in this season. Let's be connected, and in this season, let's thrive. We've looked at a couple of, a couple of allegories. I'm the vine you're the branches. We've looked a little at the Song of Songs. And I believe that the picture today is this. Let's remain consistent and enduring as disciples of Jesus. And maybe, just maybe, as we're cleansed and pruned, we can be more and more fruitful. I want to produce much fruit, don't you? Fruit that won't spoil. Fruit that will endure. May God help us with that. And it's interesting that the very last sentence of our reading today is this. This is my commandment. Love each other. Intimate walk with God, but also living alongside friends who love you. And I just want to say we really value what you're doing week in, week out. We wish we could be connected more. Sometimes it's the odd text. Sometimes it's the odd Zoom call. But our prayer is that right across this network, we'll love God passionately 
and we will serve together as friends of God. Thanks so much for allowing me to share with you. I really do value uh, our relationships together. God bless.